Thank you so much for having me here on the program. Uh, this is actually my third time presenting here at the Great Conference. This is joint work with Brenda Mitchell over here and Stan Winoberg uh, of the Columbia. So I want to start off with a quote. So this says, commuting to the office is obsolete because it's cheaper, easier, faster to do what the 19th century could not do, move information and with it office work to where the people are. So I like this quote because it's from basically when I was born. And so for my entire life, people have been predicting the death of the office. And essentially, our research question is to ask whether this moment has finally arrived. So this is an important question to answer, both because commercial real estate is a large asset class, one of particular importance to institutional and long-term investors. So the size of the overall commercial real estate universe is something like $5 trillion. Office is a pretty big part of that. In New York City alone, we have over $170 billion worth of commercial office. And I think it's also important to understand how the valuation of commercial real estate is changing in order to help understand broadly the shifts in society that we're seeing around remote work to sort of quantify how important this technological disruption is. So we're gonna do two things in this paper. The first thing we're gonna do is show that they've been large shifts in office demand that really do appear to be driven by remote work. We're gonna see huge shifts in rental revenue over the last several years. That's really coming predominantly from the quantity dimension. So many fewer leases are being signed. There's an element of uh, flight to quality in this, as it's not affecting all properties uh, you know, in the same way. But in fact, younger, more expensive buildings are holding up better relative to older buildings, which in turn implies there's a possibility for a big stranded asset problem. Because you have these older buildings that are seeing huge drops in their value because of these technological disruptions mean that people don't really want to use them as much. And when I argue, it really does seem to be shifts around remote hybrid work that appear to be driving these trends. Next, we're going to take a structural asset pricing approach to try to value how important these shifts appear to be in the office market. This is actually a difficult challenge because commercial real estate is a very illiquid and opaque asset class. So we're going to bring to bear new data sources and a new modeling framework to try to understand conceptually how important are these shifts for the value of commercial office space. So to do so, we're going to try to learn what we can from publicly traded instruments to the extent that they exist, use information broadly from the overall universe, and understand both cash flow and discount rate effects. And here's the bottom line. So our estimate is that the value of New York City office fell by over 40% in 2020. So that's a period when we had both a recessionary environment as well as a lot of remote work. And you know, going forward, we project about a 40% drop in value by 20. 29. So this appears to be a pretty persistent shock with a lot of uncertainty and dispersion around those estimates shown by the shading of the blue, which corresponds to the uncertainty and the risk around how sticky work from home is really going to be, right? And so there's some sample paths shown in red where we really stick with remote work, and those are much worse situations for commercial office buildings. So uh, there's a lot of literature here. Um, just two kind of quick strands I want to reference. One is there's actually a pretty large and growing spatial equilibrium framework. So these models and these papers approach this problem by solving for one spatial equilibrium in a pre-work from home world and a post-work from home world. The way our approach differs is that it really takes more of a finance perspective and so considers risk dynamics and the transition path of how we get from one equilibrium to the other. And the other strand of literature pertains to understanding remote work more broadly. So my, my discussant has done a lot of great work here trying to quantify and understand how large and important these shocks appear to be. Okay, so let's start by talking about how big remote work is and what it's been doing to the office. So a simple way of figuring out how much remote work there is is to use this data provider many people have looked at called Castle. So this uses turnstile data. So effectively, when you swipe into an office, it tags your physical entry. And what we sort of see here is that if you just go to any office building and just sort of count the number of people that are there, you see about half as many people physically in the office compared to the number of people that were there before the pandemic. And these rates are kind of stabilizing over time. Um, and you can see them for a couple of different cities here. Basically, you see that there's been a huge shock to how much remote work there really seems to be. And this is kind of happening, you know, not just in the pandemic itself, but really going out several years since then, whereby you know, the whole rest of society is back, right? We're all here in this room, we're all traveling, the flight's gonna be really packed when you try to get back. So the whole rest of society has really come back with this one exception. 
this is the one really durable shock that the pandemic has left is this kind of shift to new types of work patterns. Now, we're then gonna ask, okay, what does this mean for the office? So to do so, we're gonna use this data provider called Comstack, which provides us really, we think, good coverage of office leases starting from after 2015. So we're gonna have a lot of markets here. And the first is descriptive fact is just to count the revenue that is coming in for office leases. And so there's a 17% decline in leasing revenue from before the pandemic through May of 2022. And we're in the process of extending this out uh, further, but it's sort of a similar pattern if you go out a few more months. So where is that shock in rent in leasing revenue coming from? A lot of it is coming from the occupancy dimension. So you can see that here, we're now asking about contractual occupancy. So this is asking how much office space is being rented or is available or vacant. And so for Manhattan, you can see we went from about a you know 12%-ish uh, vacancy rate before the pandemic to now getting closer to 20 or 25%. Uh, the situation in San Francisco is even more stark. So that went from about a 6% vacancy rate to really historic levels of vacancy in the office, closer to, uh, closer to uh, you know, 25% or in some sources, you'll see 30 or 35% vacancy rates in San Francisco. This is actually a quite dramatic shift, especially taking into account the fact that most leases are fairly long-term in nature. Right? So you'll sign a commercial lease for a period of time. And so actually only a fraction of commercial leases have actually come due over this time period. And so the fact that you see such dramatic shifts on the occupancy dimension tells you that so many people that are leasing office space have been exiting those leases when those leases have been coming due over the last couple of years. We also look at rents. So rents have also declined. We measure rents through a measure called uh, net effective rent. So this takes into account other leasing terms, not just the rent itself, like tenant improvements and so on and so forth. So in New York City, we see about a 16% decline in rents in 2020 and a little bit of a recovery since then. This rent decrease is not uniform across properties, but it really affects older, lower amenity, amenity buildings more. We can see this by measuring a rent gradient. So this is plotting the rent of a building against its age. And what we see is that before the pandemic, you know, there was a gradient, meaning that newer buildings are valued more than older buildings. And this gradient actually gets more steep. So the newest buildings, the ones that have the highest rent range, so that ones that are the most expensive within their submarket, are actually retaining or even increasing their value. While the buildings that are really old, uh, that are really low in rent, are seeing much larger decreases in demand. So this pattern is actually somewhat surprising because I've just shown you there's a huge demand shock. People are really demanding much less office. It's not ex ante obvious that people would actually upgrade the quality at the same time there's a drop in demand. And what I think is going on here is that firms are trying to substitute towards higher quality office space in order to encourage and incentivize workers to come in to the extent that they do have back to office plans. Okay, so a lot of shifts in the office market. Are they really associated with remote work? To understand that, we have looked at this data provider called Scoob. So they have estimated back to work plans for 3,000 firms in the economy. So that covers over 40 million employees. And we have linked those back to office plans. So like how many days of the week are you planning on coming in? And to that firm's office choice. And what we see is that if my firm is really trying to get employees to show up four or five days a week, the decline in that firm's change in space is not nearly as dramatic as if the firm is really moving fully remote, uh, going to you know, zero or just one day a week, and hybrid work is somewhere in the middle. So that also is actually not obvious because you know, people don't go into the office on Saturday and Sunday, and yet you still need office space. And yet what it seems is that firms that have moved to hybrid work plans have been able over time to figure out staggering and other ways of consolidating their employees so that you don't need to demand as much space. So you can do that, for instance, through hot desking, having employees reserve space as needed. And this allows firms essentially to lower their office demand proportionate to how much remote work that they're doing. So these individual firm decisions aggregate up to industry and city levels. So we can measure different industries here and we estimate how much remote work the industry is doing. Um, and we can measure how much space that entire industry is demanding in our Comstack data set. And we see that the more remote the industry is, the more, you know, the less space is being renewed by that industry, right? Um, and the same thing at the city level. So here we're measuring the whole citywide vacancy rate. And we see that the cities that have more remote work are seeing larger declines in vacancy, are seeing more vacancy show up uh, overall. 
All right, so I've shown you so far that there are these really large shifts in office demand that seem to be driven by remote work. We're not going to try to quantify these shifts a little bit more in the context of a structural model. So this is going to be a fairly you know, straightforward conceptual idea, right? We want to value a building based on the present discounted value of you know, future revenue minus costs. One of the key complications in doing so is going to be to recognize that in this context, the revenues are going to come from leasing revenues. And we're going to have to take into account these costs as well. And then finally, think about what's the right discount rate uh, to apply to the valuation of an office building. So one of the contributions here of the paper is to come up with a framework and modeling tool for thinking about the asset pricing of commercial buildings. OK, so to do so, we're first going to start with economic states of the world. So we're going to have a Markov transition state variable, which will have the usual things, the expansions and the recessions. So that, that part is all pretty normal. We're going to introduce two new components here, a work from home expansion and a work from home recession. The idea is the economy can now travel between expansions and recessions while there's also a lot of remote work going on in the economy. And those two transition paths between expansions, recessions, and between remote work and not remote work are sort of independent decisions. Then we're going to need to price the, the SDF in those two different states. And again, we're going to have sort of a separate shifter process to value the state prices in the uh, non-work from home period and add an additional component to figure out what's happening in the work from home regime. For revenues, we're going to have these leases and we're going to make a simplifying assumption that we can express all the leasing revenue portfolio in a Calvo style framework, right? So I just have a certain portfolio of leases and some random fraction of these Calvo style are going to come due every period. That's going to add to my stock of vacant leases. And so what am I going to do for my revenue? I'm going to release some of my leases that are coming due this period. I'm also going to add new leases for my, my vacant stock. And that's going to result in a new state variable the next period, which is my new stock of vacant space. And as I release this, this space, it's going to, the, the rent by which I do so is going to be determined by that aggregate state. And then finally, there are costs, which are just divided up into variable costs, which depend on occupancy, some fixed costs that act as a little bit of operational leverage, and finally, some additional costs associated with transactions. OK, so to calibrate this model, we're going to fix a lease expiration parameter that matches what we see uh, in the data overall to get the average lease duration right. And we pick some depreciation, uh, which is close to the amount for tax purposes. The really hard part is going to come when we try to figure out what are the cash flows that are going to apply for these different states. So for expansions and recessions, remember those are the standard economic states. We're going to look at historic rent growth data in our Comstack data set going back about 20 years across a few different regimes, right? So basically, we just look historically at what rent growth has been like when the market is doing well versus the market doing poorly. And then to measure what's going on in these work from home states, we're going to look at the first year of the pandemic. We're going to call that a work from home recession. We estimate the rent growth in that period as the, as the, as the bad work from home recession state. And then we're going to look at what happened the next couple of years as reflecting a work from home expansion period. And we're going to assume that the changes in rents that we observe in those periods are going to be symptomatic of future cash flows that building owners can expect in these economic states. All right. Uh, so then uh, we are looking at estimating renewal and vacancy rates. So we match vacancy rate movements for New York City and estimate lower demand for the pandemic period. And then we include supply. So we base that on historic values in expansions and recessions and depreciation with lower supply in the work from home period, reflecting either cancellation of construction plans or conversion of some of this office space into residential. Now, to estimate state prices here, we've got a free work from home SDF that's pretty standard. It matches the risk-free rate and the equity risk premium in both expansion and recession states. The new part here is to allow for additional work from home risk. So what, you know, what is work from home risk and how would we measure it? We have here the idea that we don't know how long we're going to stake in this work from home regime, and it generates a new source of priced uncertainty and risk for commercial real estate firms. To estimate this, we're going to do a Fama McBeck procedure where we generate a portfolio, which intuitively you can think of as going long Zoom stock and short Carnival Cruises. And we're going to find that this long short portfolio co-varies with the returns on publicly traded office REITs in a way that did not happen before. So it looks like office REITs are, have a new priced risk factor that is associated with something like the technological disruptions associated with remote work. And we're going to use this to basically get an additional risk premium that office buildings are facing. We can also do everything else without this, without this risk part uh, and just do everything cash flow side as well. 
And then finally, we're going to have to estimate how persistent remote work is. So this is going to be a little bit challenging. Our best guess of doing so um, is going to look at, you know, estimate everything else and basically match the observed decline in New York City office REITs over the pandemic. So the New York City office REITs for NATO, SL Green, and Empire State Trust, they don't own very much of the office stock. In general, they own the higher end part of the office stock. So we want to use the model to kind of extrapolate and learn something about all of New York City office buildings. But we think we can use the return for these office REITs in order to pin down the persistence parameter for how likely it is that remote work is going to persist year on year. And the basic intuition is just that the more persistent remote work is going to be, given all the other parameters I've laid out, the larger is going to be the equity decline in these publicly traded office REITs. And so the realized decline was something like 22%. Uh, in the first period of the, of the pandemic, and that pins down a persistence parameter of uh, 0.8, meaning that every year there's an 80% chance we stay in the work from home uh, work from home state. Um, and you know, but we can do all sorts of robustness around that specific estimate. So these are the headline estimates again. So we estimate for New York City overall a 40% uh, decline initially. That seems fairly persistent in the long run, with this risk and uncertainty around it, reflecting the model's movement across different work from home states, different expansions and recessions. The A plus building was match that overall decline for the for the for the REITs. That's held up value a little bit better. And so the flip side is that the lower quality buildings, the older buildings, are going to experience a much larger decline in value. We've also done this for other cities. So San Francisco sees a much larger decline in value, whereas Sunbelt areas like Austin have you know seem like they're recovering in value a little bit better. So there's geographic dispersion reflecting some of the variation we see in remote work practices. Okay, just have just a couple of minutes left. So I want to talk about the bigger picture implications of these findings. So one simple exercise is just to kind of scale up our estimates across the whole country. We estimate something like a $400 billion loss for the value of office buildings across the whole country. Um, and these losses are not just contained to office buildings, but spill over to other adjacent uses like retail. Conversion is a big discussion here. So a good example is actually across the street, you've got the Tribune Tower, which is a, you know, a double-stranded asset problem. First is a newspaper disrupted by the internet. And then second, the whole office building was converted into uh, you know, luxury condos. That's possible for some buildings, particularly older buildings that have narrower floor plates. It's actually quite complicated, it seems like, for newer buildings. Um, and so this is a long-term process that will likely take uh, you know, a long time to kind of uh, play out. Here's something that might be of interest to the group. This is who owns commercial real estate debt and equity. So you see that the debt ownership, this is for all commercial real estate, is heavily concentrated in banks, not surprisingly, plus insurance and pension funds, uh, some, and some is securitized as well. Here's the equity ownership just of office buildings. So you see that this is, these are also broadly uh, held across a, a number of different categories of uh, institutional investors and user and operators. So we think that declines in value are going to broadly affect a lot of the overall ecosystem here. Um, the securitized debt is actually traded and has credit default swaps written against it. So we actually look at the pricing of those credit default swaps. And it's a little bit complicated. Long story short, the market is currently right now pricing in about a 20% default rate for office loans. Um, you can kind of see that because the, you know, especially in the last couple of months, you see a huge declines um, in those CMBX indices here, which correspond to the price of purchasing default uh, protection insurance against the performance of these underlying commercial mortgages. Uh, remember, I just said banks were one of the biggest holders of the debt here. So we plotted uh, bank exposure. This is for all commercial real estate. Um, and you know, just the takeaway here is that a lot of the banks that are currently failing, right? these sort of smaller regional banks, they're the ones that have a lot of commercial real estate exposure. So just to wrap up, um, why is this important to understand? Well, that the chain of events we were concerned about is one that you have a decline in real estate value that hits tax revenue for cities, that then forces adjustments of less spending, more taxation, which then drive out migration in, in, a, in a destructive spiral. So we think that city, you know, cities are ultimately anchored by the value of all this office and commercial real estate. So understanding these dynamics is very important. Thank you. Look forward to the comments from a discussion.